Well, Henry talked about caring, God caring for us. Tonight's lesson should do that. I'm more excited about this lesson than maybe anyone I've ever given. I gladly spent many hours researching and reading this. And is it harder to write a big, thick book or a small book? A small book. I had to leave so much great stuff on the cutting, or the, whatever they call the editing room floor, that I think next February I'm going to do uh, reproduction too. There's just so much amazing material showing how God cares about us. And this is a DVD that I hope a lot of Christian people politely share with atheists and have them consider these facts and really consider their worldview on whether God exists or not. Because this lesson, it just mightily speaks of the greatness of God and all the glories to Him. Amen? Amen. Okay. Okay. I, I work as an engineer, but the field of science that fascinates me the most is biology. Now, I don't think I could be a biologist because there's just too many things to memorize. How many amens to that? <laughs> so much memorization. Math you can figure out, but I admire people with biology degrees. Well, I took biology at night, and I did it through Coastline College. You can take the tests online, and I encourage all of you here to do it. If you take a class for the fun and the learning, it's a lot better than if you care about the grade. Amen? So I took the biology class, and I wanted to see what they taught about evolution, but I also wanted to see about the marvels of design and what God did. When it came to the systems of the human body, which was by far my favorite part of the class, the plant biology didn't interest me too much, but the human stuff did. How many people can relate to this? Just fascinated. And before we got into the systems of the human body, I said, I want to study these systems, and then I'm going to vote which one is the most awesome design of them all. So I, I turned it into like a little contest. There's many systems in the human body, as you can see, respiratory, digestive, lymphatic, endocrine, circulatory, nervous, etc. Okay? Well, just a few facts from the uh, body systems. Your respiratory system, if you stretched it out, it would cover a tennis court, the surface area of that. A little digestive fact, your digestive tract is 30 feet long. Pretty amazing stuff. The skeletal system amazingly makes red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and the bone marrow, and it regulates it. It makes them in the right amount. Leukemia is simply you're making too many immature white blood cells. They're just not quite there, and of course, that can be fatal. My daughter had leukemia. Uh, she was able to beat it through uh, God's grace and fantastic medical care at Chalk Hospital. Another blessing to be an American, amen, our health care system. This one will blow you away. You make 8 million red blood cells every second of your life. 8 million die every second, 8 million live. Incredible chemical factory inside your body. But, to me, none of those systems compare <coughs> to the reproductive system. None of the systems come close in complexity in amazing ways they work as to the reproductive system. Now, who wants to take a guess why I put this up there? Yes? It had to have been there by... It didn't just get there by itself. So you okay. had to design it. Okay, that is the result of design, yes? Uh, everything about it is so perfectly uh, set in place that uh, you move just a little bit and then right. fall down just like that tower of cards. Right. And okay. the top cards without the bottom. Mm -hmm. Appreciate the answers, but uh, uh, Christian, I put that up there because our bodies are delicate little house of cards. You change this one tiny little factor and everything falls apart, right? I say to people, and it's not simplistic, you can't have something laying here waiting for a liver to evolve, right? You need everything working at once. You need all the body systems working, and the reproductive system probably has 10 million little details for them all to work or you're not going to have any offspring. And we're going to touch on some of those. So your bodies, you're fearfully and wonderfully made, very delicate. You just tweak a little chemical imbalance in you a little bit, and you're all messed up, right? So glory to God for the fantastic design that he made in us. So you all are a wonderful house of cards. Trivia time. I like to have trivia. What is the first commandment God gave to man? Very good. 
God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That's the first commandment God gave to man. Okay? But we don't always listen to God, do we? So not only did he command it, he made it a desire for people and pleasurable. Just think of the details. If reproduction was really painful, none of us would be here today, right? But God is smarter than us. He knows how we think and act. And this might be one of the more somewhat embarrassing, but it shouldn't be. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. Now, when people uh, reach their pleasure, you can call it an orgasm, certain chemicals are released. And this is just the chemical process of how it works. Now you can see how I spelt it out. I did that for me, okay? Oh, and another thing, if you want to teach this lesson, there's the PowerPoint will guide you right through it. Because I would truly like you guys to give creation lessons to groups that you're involved with, amen? You can do it. Everything in here is self-guided. So oxytocin is a hormone from the pituitary gland. It sensitizes nerves on muscles causing contraction and pleasure. Other chemicals called endorphins. How many people have heard of endorphins? Incredibly important chemicals that God produced for humans and other animals too. It's a natural pain reliever. It's a peptide. It's not quite a protein, but it's a chain of amino acids in the right sequence and in the right shape. Released by the pituitary gland, the hypothalamus, and attached to opioids. I want to make sure I get that right. Uh, receptors. So. What's interesting is, has anyone ever heard of vestigial organs? Yeah. You know, evolutionists talk about them. Well, 100 years ago, they were saying the pituitary gland was vestigial, the hypothalamus was vestigial. They said, oh, these are organs we no longer need. They're leftovers from our evolutionary past. Well, they didn't know what they were for 100 years ago. Now we know they're all vital for life. There are zero vestigial organs in the human body. So I want to just talk about endorphins a little bit. And truly the good news for you is I'm not a medical doctor, I'm not a medical researcher, so everything's going to be really, really simple. I heard videos by geniuses and a lot of it I couldn't understand. So when I explain endorphins to you, it's going to be very simple. Think of a space station circling the Earth and then other little vehicles attached to it. As simple as that. They dock to it, okay? That's how endorphins work. Like you've got your nerves here, and then the neurotransmitters, the endorphins attach to it and give you that sense of pleasure. It's the right connection, the right shape, just like a space shuttle or a space station docking in space. So that's a good layman's explanation of how that works. What do you guys think? Is that by design or billions of years of time, nature, and chance? Beautiful, beautiful design, okay? <clears throat> now, good luck to you if you can find an evolutionist to explain the origin of sexual reproduction. I've Googled it, I've looked at it, I found one explanation. They'd love to tell you it's true, the theory of evolution is true. Good luck on trying to get an explanation on the details of how it happened, amen? As you know, you're all adults, sexual reproduction requires a male and a female, okay? Now, you have 46 chromosomes in all the cells of your body except your gametes, your reproductive cells, okay? So the female has 23, the male has 23. When they merge, you get 46 again. So a fair question to ask an evolutionist is, how did we evolve 46 chromosomes everywhere except in our gametes? Think if you're the evolutionist. Would you have a good answer? Well, they don't either. Lynn Margolis is a big-time evolutionist. She's been published. I don't doubt her intelligence. and She's a professor. She came up with an answer. She said male-female reproduction originated. You know, 46 chromosomes everywhere except the reproduction. Anybody want to guess? Cannibalism. You're saying, oh, you're putting words in her mouth, Mr. Morgan. No, this is what she said. You can look it up. Organisms would eat each other. In some cases, they don't digest their prey's chromosomes, and they wind up with twice as many. So let me simplify for you. You got a blob here with, say, 23 chromosomes, and another blob here. One eats the other, 
and it has 46 chromosomes in part of its body, but not in all of its body, so that's how they had twice as many in certain parts of their body. And then over millions of years, you get sexual reproduction. What do you think? <laughs> Awful, isn't it? Awful. Do you know why now they don't teach the details of the theory of evolution? They will tell you most people believe it, this is science, this is biology, but when you look at every detail, it falls apart. But that's the only explanation that I've seen on the details of the origin of sexual reproduction. Any comments or questions on that? Interactions are a fine thing. The one that you said, that they, the 46 were superior, so that's why they became the most prevalent, except for they isolated in the... Uh... And do they say that the sperm and the egg eat each other, and that's why they're 46? She didn't get into that detail. Yeah. Right. But somehow, by eating, half your body had twice as many chromosomes as the other half, and over millions of years, that's how it evolved. Yeah, it's, it's really sad. Are they seeking truth? Do you think she really believes that? I don't either. I think she's trying to prove something, but I don't think she really believes that. So I made some fun cartoons here. The more I think, the more confused I get. So this is a young evolutionist thing. They eat each other? It's confusing. Well, I know evolution is true, but I get so confused when I try to explain it. They should be willingly explain the details if they really did believe it. But they believe the conclusion. They're just working on the data to support that conclusion, which is science in reverse. Data should lead to the conclusion. Amen? Okay. Ovaries. Everything I teach you is going to be real simple, okay? Females have two ovaries. They take turns each month ovulating. Like this one could do January, this one could do February, March, April, etc. If the woman suffers damage to one of her ovaries, guess what? The other one takes over and produces one every month. There is so much to this universe and our bodies that we don't even understand, amen? And that's just one of them. This might sound childish, but it almost seems like we're a factory and like an angel is watching over us and our chemical balances, the maintenance. Does that make sense to you guys? You scratch yourself and it sends all kinds of lymphocytes to it. It's like a well-maintained factory and we have a humble, or a mighty God that we should be all humble to. Okay, now a little egg release, release trivia. When it leaves the ovary, the egg, it leaves a scar. How many people here have scars? You still have them? I got a beautiful scar right here when I broke my wrist. Well, scar tissue is not the best tissue in the world. Guess what is by far and away the best scar tissue healing part of the human body? The female ovaries. Like I said, I got this scar until I die. But the, the scar tissue in the female ovaries, amazingly, because of a great God, continually heals so that the female can continually uh, release eggs. Okay? Now, some more fun details. Fimbria. Look at that. You might look at that and say, oh, yeah, that's really cool. Those are like fingers that grab the egg and pull it towards the fallopian tube. They act like fingers. Amazing stuff. It's like got a mind of its own, doesn't it? It grabs it and pulls it into the fallopian tube. So then you got the egg in the fallopian tube. Everything's set, right? Piece of cake. Now you got a hundred billion things that have to work just right. And it is amazing that any pregnancy works when you learn the details. But it's easy when we have a great God, right? <coughs> so it, the, it pulls the egg into the fallopian tube, and there's cilia in there, okay? Cilia is like tiny little hairs in the fallopian tube. But think of the details. Suppose I made you chief engineer and say, okay, I'm going to put an egg there. I want you to have the cilia move it down towards uh, the uterus. How would you do it? You just can't have them all going randomly, right? It wouldn't move. Or you can't have them going back and forth. It would push it back. You follow me? Think of the details again. You want to move that egg down the fallopian tube. A lot of you will recognize this next one. Okay. How many people hate the wave at baseball games? How, who loves it? I love it too. You're going to have fun. 
One reason I don't like baseball anymore is the music is so loud. Any amens to that? <laughs> Deafen you. But let's get back to the fallopian tube. It's, it just doesn't wave randomly. It waves continually to move it down the fallopian tube. If it didn't do that, you wouldn't have any babies as well. So that requires information. Each little cilia has the information on when to move, okay? Now we want you to go right to left, now the next one go right to left, and it pushes the egg down the fallopian tube. Information comes by chance over billions of years, right? No, it comes from intelligence, okay? And that cat is right. Another example of design in human reproduction. Now, this might cause some of you to blush, but it's pretty remarkable stuff. And this is another, maybe the first one of this is why I'm comfortable having it 18 and over, treating you all like adults. Before the big event, for the map, okay, we'll just leave it at that. There's pre-ejaculatory fluid, okay? I'm embarrassed, but, okay? Little bit can come out. Now you might say, oh man, something's wrong, my plumbing isn't working right, you know, because you got a little bit of a leak beforehand. Or does it serve a purpose? Since it's a creation lesson, take a guess. Okay, and again to repeat, treating everyone like adults, a little bit comes out before the big event, it serves an incredible